So I'm back to the foreshore for the first time in nearly six months with Nick White from Tideline Art. I know you all follow her, but in case you don't, <laughs> please do. It's well worth it. And how are you, Nick? I'm very well, thank you. I'm very well. It's great to see you again. It's been a little while and yes, um, I have been into town a couple of times but yes. I don't come here that often so it's always really nice to come here and, oh, yeah. and have a search. Yeah. Around. You tend to like the estuary as well, don't you? Yeah, I do, I do like yeah. the It's a bit less crowded maybe. <laughs> yeah, but it's lovely and quiet here, isn't it, at the moment? It is, And um, we've yes. got a couple of hours before the tide goes out and I'm looking forward to sort of getting some of your pottery expertise. Oh, thank you. Okay, let's see what we can find. Yeah, yeah. Please remember to search the Thames foreshore uh, and to remove objects. Uh, you must have a permit which you buy from the Port of London Authority. So that, I, I looked, the fabric looked old and then I saw the, the thumbing marks and it's the base of a Surrey whiteware jug probably uh, with the Potter has thumbed the edge of the base, so that'll be about 1350 to 1500. So straight back to medieval London, first bit I picked up. So Richard's already picking up pieces of history. Yes. What have you got there? Picked it up. Well, I noticed that fabric looked old because it's got little black and quartzy bits in it, and then I noticed the thumbing marks around the edge of the base. So yeah. You can actually see where the, the thumber oh. has thumbed the base up um, and it's uh, medieval Surrey ware, white ware, buff coloured clay, uh, about 1350 to 1500. 1350? Can I have a bit yeah, of sure. yeah, sure. 1350 to 1500 and that's actually somebody's fingerprint that yes. comes from the 14th century possibly. Yeah, that's the potter's finger marks and sometimes you can get fingernail marks on mm. the base you know where they've squeezed and isn't that just, incredible? just helps the pot to be more stable on a sort yeah. of rough floor well well done you're off to a flying start thank you very much yes Plenty of history down at our feet. Constantly flicking bits over, trying to find something diagnostic. Got the rim there, post medieval redware. Lovely day for mudlarking.
maybe looks a bit older. Possibly grey ware, very river worn. More grey coloured pottery. I think this is probably grey ware as well. Just a body shard from a big storage shard. One to put back, I think. It looks like stone, but it's actually a really thick bit of tile. I don't know if it's Roman or post Roman. There's lots of inclusions in it. But yeah, that's a bit of a slab. I think it probably is Roman because I mean they used to make these very large um, tiles to support floors and in hypercourse that sort of type of thing. So probably Roman. Here's a lovely old timber eroding out of the full shore. Part of an embankment oak, I guess. Been there probably hundreds of years. Bit of post medieval redware with glaze there on the inside. 16th to 19th century, very difficult to tie down unless it's got diagnostic features. This little bit here, wedged between the rocks, looks very much like Roman colour coated ware, and it is. So it's a tiny piece of Roman pottery, colour coated with a slip, and then they've trailed a thick slip onto it to make a design. You can just see the back of something, probably the back of an animal. Um, this probably comes from a hunt cup, um, and these were made with scenes of dogs chasing hares uh, or deer around them, uh, used for drinking. Small but interesting, small but perfectly formed. Uh, that's a bit of Roman hunt cup. Oh! So it's colour coated and then they've trailed a thick slip there. That's the back of an animal, probably. Okay. So they had these um, little drinking cups and they would have hunting dogs chasing round deer or hares or um, round the, the cup. And, and they used to drink ale in this, I suppose, or wine. Yes, I've wine or ale, yes, that's right. Moving along, there's an interesting green glazed bit of clay here. Let's have a look at that. Well, this is quite a nice find. Um, from the fabric, you can tell it's Surrey whiteware, medieval, 1350 to 1500. But it's got that lovely feathered pattern on it that they've um, scored into the clay. Um, so they put it into the highly decorated um, jug category. So it's actually a bit earlier than I thought. Um, the highly decorated style goes for about 1240 to 1350. It dies out about 1350, the time of the Black Death, strangely. Um, so this might be Kingston ware, um, but that would have been a, a lovely jug with a lot of decoration covering the whole surface. A bit of medieval pottery, but with some. Ooh, hang on a moment, let's yeah. wait for that helicopter to go over there. How dare it! <laughs> they know that we're busy filming. Yes, right. <laughs> how inconsiderate. Yeah, oh my goodness, what's going on? Okay, right. So, a bit of medieval pottery, you can tell by the fabric, um, but very thin, mm -hmm. and it's got that feathering oh, pattern yeah. on yeah. it. Uh, rows of feathers going down a jug. So, it's probably a highly decorated jug, which is a bit more older medieval, so sort of 1250 to 1350. 1230 to... Yeah, 1250 to 1350, that sort of okay. age bracket. So the whole surface of the jug would be covered in these little leaves or feathers, and it would have made a very nice effect. Lovely, so it might have been on the table with someone a little bit richer than oh, your usual peasant. Definitely, yeah, <laughs> definitely a higher status thing, so like um, a tavern or yeah. an inn. Or as you say, yes, merchant's house, yeah. the lord or lady or the bishop, someone like that to have his drink served out of. Mm. Oh, wonderful. 
Thanks, Richard. Okay. There's a massive tooth there. Probably big enough to be a cow or a horse, I would imagine. Lovely bit of green glaze wedged in next to this stone. The clay's very clean, so I think it's probably border wear, 1550 to 1700. Suited on the outside, so it must have been used for cooking, maybe part of a, a large um, vessel. Um, but I love that green, all coloured glaze, very nice. Stuck under this massive thing is a little handle. No, not a handle. It looked like a handle from there, but it's actually a rim of the pot. A nice bit of green glaze. Probably early post-medieval, I think, reddish clay. It's an intriguing thing. It looks like an owl's face. It's actually actually a bit of leather with a copper alloy stud in it from an old shoe. It does look like an owl's face there. Little fragment of lead and then a teeny tiny nail head or tack head copper alloy there. So we'll see if anything else turns up. There's a really old bottle there. Judging by the neck, there's a really old bottle neck here. Judging by the shape of it, I would think it's going to be 17th century, uh, like an onion shaped bottle. Um, so that's interesting to find. There might be some nice iridescence on it when it dries out. A bit of tin glazed earthenware, and the tin glaze is almost completely worn off this rim. Just a little bit left on the outside. Tin glaze ware, nicely glazed both sides, but just plain white. Uh, very functional, utilitarian stuff, late 17th, 18th century produced in large quantities but you never see it in museums because they always show the posh decorated pieces. Well here's something no one wants to pick up on the foreshore, Corona Extra. So hopefully wearing the mask on public transport I've avoided that. I guess they're going to have to rebrand their beer. Literally rescued from the waves, uh, this is a bit of Roman kitchen equipment that no Roman housewife would be without because it is part of a mortarium. So you can see these grits, and it's worn nearly smooth now, but these grits would have been proud from the surface. And you could use them, a large vessel with deep uh, rim that you could hold on to, and then you could grind your fish sauce, or your spices and herbs. And then it had a big spout to pour out the liquid contents. Um, some also are sooted outside, so the, the ingredients were heated as well to create dishes. Um, but yeah, I imagine the last person to touch this was a Roman housewife who maybe said a curse when she dropped it and it shattered all those hundreds of years ago. So that's another bit of Roman London from the Thames this morning. So, 
Right, we have found a piece of pottery that no self-respecting Roman housewife would be without. So it is mortarium. Oh, that's a piece of mortarium, yes, with yeah. the little bits of flint. So, yeah, clear on one side, um, that's the outside face, but on the inside it's got a coating of grit, probably flint. Mm -hmm. um, they've smoothed down with the you know hundreds of years of rolling around in the river, but they would have been proud of the surface and then you could use this vessel, it's got a thick rim that you could grip hold of and then you could grind your fish sauce, uh, your um, herbs, and olive oil to make a lovely sauce or dish and then there's a spout on it to pour it out and serve it. Marvellous. So another little bit of Roman London but very diagnostic. Excellent. And um, you found a larger piece of mortarium, didn't you? Did you? Did you find a large piece? Did you keep it? Not today. Oh. No. <laughs> I have in the past. Yes, not quite as big as the one you got. No. That's um, that's really special, though. Yeah. You you did you find a whole one, Miss Steve? Um, I found a whole one actually uh, yeah. when I went out on my own once. It was in three bits, but I stuck it together, yes. and uh, I'm very very proud of it. Oh yeah, that's, that's really something. Yeah, of course, it wasn't um, mortarium that you found, it was the, the roof tile. Yeah, that's it, I'm yes. getting it confused. So those are Roman, or parts of Roman roof tiles. Yes, and you do find a lot of these broken fragments at this part of the foreshore. Um, so these are teguli, so you have a tegula and a tegula, and you put them together on your roof, and then you have a curved tile, which bridges the gap between the two and fits over the two uh, rims there. Okay. Um, and imbrex and that makes your Roman roof, so you have layers of these going up. Uh, very substantial tiles, so a complete roof is very heavy, it weighs tons and tons. Yeah. So you have to have quite a substantial building to hold them up. Um, simpler buildings were just thatched. Okay, so tegula. And, yes. Uh, so two tegula is a teguli. Yeah, that's right. Yes. <laughs> teguli, <Your> tegulum, <laughs> tegula. Yeah. Your Latin lesson for today. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> So Thank part you. of a Roman roof, just need to find a couple of thousand more and then I can yeah, build then an extension. Yeah, then we could imagine that having a Roman roof. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Another piece of red tile, uh, but this has got a flange cut in it, which is probably uh, Roman tegula. They would have a flange um, cut in it to join onto the next tile, uh, in the next row down. So you've often wondered, is my tile Roman or is my tile later, medieval or post-medieval? Well, here's a little hack. It's not 100% foolproof like all these things, but the fabric of Roman tiles is a lot softer. Um, and so it's actually possible, especially when they're damp just after washing, to mark a piece of paper with them and some of the fabric actually comes off. Whereas the later tiles, um, harder fired and you don't get anything apart from scratch uh, you don't get anything on the paper so just to recap briefly Roman roof tiles you have the tegula which is the L-shaped one with the rim and two tegulae fit side by side and the imbrex is the curved tile that fits over them and at the edge of each of the tegulae, there is a flange cut out. So each row will slot in to the next row above and below on your Roman roof. A shadowy blue and white transfer printed late Georgian or Victorian person. Surprise, surprise, some willow pattern, transfer printed, the most common pottery design, um, late Georgian, Victorian, but likely simple the English interpretation of Chinese style. A few feet away, another bit of uh, probably Victorian stoneware, a bit later maybe, it looks like a Bristol glaze, something Hipson. TTE, Charlotte, hmm. another mystery from the Thames. 
about an earring, but it's not very old or very interesting. Certainly not silver or probably even silver plated. Just a hoop one. And here, someone's been having a party, I think. There's a whole lot of these nitrous oxide gas canisters that people use for illegal or illegal highs. Nice little bit tucked in the rocks there. 17th century clay pipe bowl. There's the spur in the bowl there, but it is broken. So although interesting and old, I'm throwing him back for another time. You do get some fantastic shapes. It's probably part of scaffolding, that's iron. But eventually they all blend into the same sort of colour. Bits of paving stones, concrete, brick, rolled around, the edges are softened and they become part of the river. Slate tile, clay roof tile, pottery, little bits of blue and white, bone, stoneware, point the action of the river and time it wears down everything. years of civilization. The people who use these things and threw them away for flesh and blood just like you and me. amount of plastic here. I have picked some of it up but there's no way I can put it up. Another 18th century clay pipe stuck in there with a reasonable amount of stem. So yeah that big bowl, 18th century, uh, no maker's mark. Oh hang on, yes there are this is the maker's mark on it, sorry. Uh, it looks like IS, which would be if you hold the bowl away from you, the I would be the Christian name and the S would be the surname of the maker. So maybe I would also be J. So something like John Smith. So a fairly common combination of letters, I feel. But I'm going to keep that one. There's a pretty thing underneath this driftwood. It's just a bit of slipware. So the pattern's very worn, but you can still just see. The wavy line pattern, probably border wear, probably 17th century, um, but a, a pleasant enough piece of slip wire to pick up. I think it's a piece of porcelain, it doesn't look Chinese, it's not quite blue enough, uh, but it's got some nice decoration on it. Tendrils, vines, 
snakes maybe? So I can hardly contain myself because Nick has brought one of her favourite coins to show us and I think you will gasp when you see it. It is actually a silver half crown of Elizabeth the First. There we are, so that beautiful coin. So that's a solid silver coin from Elizabeth the First, which is what, 1558 to 1601. That's right, so this coin yeah. was struck in 1601. Oh right, so that's nearly the last year of her reign, isn't yeah. it? 1601 or 1603? 1603, 1603, 1603. yeah. Isn't that a beauty? That's just amazing. And considering that's been in the river for, what, 400 years? Yeah. You know, it's preservation is beautiful. It's got a, a Latin motto around it. Yes, I can't remember exactly what it says in Latin. You might be able to no. read it, but it means I have made God my helper. Right, yes, posui deum ad salvatori meum. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> Beautiful. Isn't it? Because uh, he, he fought in World War One. Oh, I see, so you actually managed to do some. Oh, yeah, I found his grave. Yeah, he's called Frederick Jury. He lived in Woolwich and he was born in about 1873. Yeah. And he was quite old when he went to, now hang on, 73, is that right? He was about 45 or something when he went to join the Australian Imperial Force in Australia. He travelled oh. over from England. Wow. 